My fruit cakes. How the devil are you? <laughs> my fruit loops. My fruit crumbles. My my fruity fruit cakes. How the devil are you today? As we enter, Platinum Week. Yes, the Queen appears to be alive. Can she make it? <laughs> Can she make it? Just a few more days. Come on, Your Majesty. Can you imagine if she keels over and carks it? <laughs> in the next couple of days that'll be it. put a bit of a damp squib on proceedings won't it but we can will her onwards and upwards till she's 110 120 years old and i'm sure she'll go on the weather here today was rather gray and rather rainy so i was in my element there i loved it now the sun is shining so I've got a feeling it's going to be like that over uh, Platinum Weekend. Reports when I looked at the weather said sun, 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 sun. And then on the Sunday it said cloudy, but no rain. So no rain is the main thing. Let's keep our fingers crossed for that. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like it's going to be divine shimmering skies, but uh, let's hope it's at least clear and not too overcast. So exciting times. Not quite so exciting for Megan, is it? I mean, she's going to have to start paying Sunshine Sachs a bit more money because publicity ain't going well. Regardless of your opinion one way or the other on what happened in Texas or Mr. Markle, the fallout from that in the press uh, doesn't seem to be doing her many favours. I've been on the hunt for some time for a signature jacket to wear on this channel. And I decided I wanted it to be a regal red one, preferably velvet. And I've been on the hunt. It's so hard to find exactly the right red. Because uh, I wanted it to sort of match my avatar, which is red. So I would imagine you associate that colour with me. And I found one. I, found, I took a risk online because when you find things online, you never know how they're going to turn up. Do you and this one was a no returns accepted affair because it's second hand and uh yes i'm going to share it with you i will continue to of course wear many different clothes for you and share with you my charity shop finds my vintage finds that will not change but because i'm coming to you a bit more regularly than i used to i want to be able to fall back on a signature item that you can associate with me and this jacket is just so lovely and it is an Alexander McQueen affair and I don't know what the price was originally but online I'd see them going second hand all over the place for about 400 pounds well I managed to get this down with the power of haggling my dear at a vintage boutique uh, to about 160 pounds so not cheap but it's an investment piece and it's so nice i thought i would only really wear it here on the channel but i'm going to be wearing it to evening events and cocktail parties there's something about the jewel colors of velvet that make everyone look so exquisite and really bring out the the complexion if you hit the right color and they're such tactile fabric aren't they the velvet so i will just give you a glimpse of it and also I, it will show me how it reads on camera but uh, yes a sort of bright red i really hope this is going to come over nicely on the camera because everything i wear i wore a green top the other day which is pure green but when it was on camera it looked a sort of teal blue so things can change but i hope that's going to look nice and the thing about it you see is that it fits me like a glove because i'm tall with long limbs and so sometimes i have to buy a larger size jacket but then it's sort of slouchy at the waist all the shoulders don't fit and this one nips in really tight at the waist which is good and the arms aren't all baggy and hanging off me so very excited for that what do you think and you may have noticed the other day i was toying with the idea of changing the channel name to river and the royals just because i thought it sort of showed what this channel discusses uh, I know you say that i talk about a range of things but it will always be focused and centered on the royal family and ex-royals on this channel so i was toying with the idea of changing it, and i put up a poll in the community section for you to vote for your favorite and the vast majority of you i think over 80 percent wanted me to remain river so I, I took your advice in this instance i cleaved to your wisdom and i'm leaving it as river for now 
and thanks to all who responded. I've deleted it now because the, there were too many comments coming in, but I want you to know those who responded, I screenshotted all of your replies, so I absorbed them, read them, digested them. I'm grateful for your input. So river it is and river it remains. This made me smile, this rather jolly tribute to the Queen. Lara Mason unveiled a life-size cake of Her Majesty. <laughs> Looks scrumptious, doesn't it? Need a large cup of tea to wash that down with. Big Willie enjoyed a big old hug. They call them man hugs, but I'm not sure what the difference is between a man hug and a woman hug. But Big old man hug with Mike Tindall the other day. This was at the Horton International Horse Trials in Norfolk. They were there to support Zara, who was competing. And the Tindall's little bands were there. The Queen's great-grandchildren, Lucas and Mia. They were frolicking around a playground, a little fun fair, and gambling in the sun. Zara is a really nice example of what can be achieved when you're not a working member of the royal family and how you can do it with some modicum of class and dignity and without looking like you're a grasping, desperate, zealous celebrity. Ella Harkles, you know, look at the way she's done it because she gets the best of both worlds. She's got no HRH title and she isn't a working royal, but she gets all these brand deals and really quite lucrative ones. She's worked with Rolex, she's got her own jewellery range, she's there representing another brand this week, but also she dedicates a lot of her time to charitable causes and she's very private. She keeps her, her life on the low low. So you don't always need to justify your or philanthropic goings on by peddling in all these vulgar shows and exposés, memoirs and uh, reality shows, this kind of thing, which cheapens the image of the royal family. That is the kind of template that they should have used and could have used. And I think they would have been more respected if they'd have gone down that path. I was reading today that her makeup artist has flown into the UK ready to tend to her and make her look wonderful for all her appearances. And you know, this is what I find rather vulgar because can you imagine Princess Anne doing this or one of the other less senior members of the royal family, you know, hauling in professional makeup artists? She's just a relative that's coming to appear at a church service. Can't she just whack on a bit of mascara and lip balm and be done with it? You know, why does she have to go to all these pains? She actually looks perfectly acceptable without makeup, so I don't know why she has to drag herself up on all these occasions. Or maybe the artist is for Harry, I don't know. One thing that will be rather irksome for them is the fact that Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, has come down with COVID and mild pneumonia. So he won't be overseeing and preaching at the service at St Paul's, as was expected. The Archbishop of York will be preaching instead. And as I whispered to you a few weeks ago, there was some gossip that the Harkles uh, were very keen to be cozying up to the Archbishop of Canterbury during their visit here for various reasons. It looks like that will not be possible now. So I'm afraid that's going to put a bit of a dampener on some of their plans. I'm actually rather pleased that Mr. Welby won't be overseeing things because he's become rather outspoken on the subject of politics recently and has been accused of wokery. <laughs> Everyone's been accused of wokery these days, aren't they, my dears? But he's been accused of a bit of that, which, as is the Church of England in general, actually, uh, pandering to woke ideologies, which is very sad and won't serve them in the long run. It seems rather likely, doesn't it, that the Queen will be introduced to Lilibet on her first birthday. William and Catherine will be 130 miles away in Cardiff, representing Her Majesty. So they won't be around for Lilibet's birthday. I think it's lovely that the Queen will get to meet her great-granddaughter and namesake. Uh, however, I will be disappointed if we get some sort of official photograph emerging on Jubilee weekend. I think it's fair enough if that emerges a few weeks afterwards, but to have it on the weekend I know might please the hearts of some, but for me I don't want the association with these former, you know, these non-working royals to be clouding anything over Platinum Weekend, but that's just me. Although, of course, I have to consider the fact that even though I think they are desperate to associate 
Lily Bet the sequel with the original and certainly have that image of the two in their possession. Whether or not they will be happy to hand over the responsibility of that unveiling to palace officials as opposed to their own outposts remains to be seen. I'm uncomfortable that they've extended their lease at Frogmore Cottage. Even if they want to keep some kind of pied de terre or some mansion uh, in the kingdom for their purposes, I don't feel that it should be on royal property. They're not working royals. And uh, to be quite honest, stay there. My last couple of videos attracted some criticism because I defended Meghan in certain ways, not in all ways. I still criticised her, but I defended her. Actually, I didn't even defend Meghan. I simply offered a variety of explanations for her behaviour. And uh, I've disparaged Mr. Marco a couple of times. So for those of you that asked how I could dare to defend Meghan and suggested that I'm in some way going down a new path or backtracking on what I've said before. You must be new. I've defended Meghan when I felt necessary since the beginning of this channel. I defend what I see as the truth at the time. It's why this channel sprung up, because I knew that it was a lie that this country, this nation is bigoted or racist. I knew that what they were saying about the royal family and our people was disingenuous and I felt that it needed defending. And it doesn't matter who it is, Catherine, Meghan, Harry, William, or anybody else. I will defend what I see as the truth and call out lies and misinformation at other quarters. I don't care where it comes from. So just as I criticized Meghan for making the whole event in Texas all about her, whether or not her intentions were good or not, I make no apologies whatsoever for rejecting lies and misinformation that spread up around the whole thing and are thrown into a frame around what's already a rather vulgar situation. One of my chief inspirations in life is Her Majesty's reign, the way she handles obstacles and challenges, and although I certainly don't live up to that sort of immaculate uh, way of responding to things all the time, I look to it for inspiration. And it's one of the reasons I'm always telling you, channel the royal spirit and stay royal. Which isn't always easy. I receive quite a lot of comments from people who say they hate Meghan and accuse her of evil. And, you know, I was watching one of the interviews of the uncle of one of the children that was murdered in Uvalde. And it was a very emotional interview lovely chap and he was so inspiring and in his raw immediate grief which was palpable he was crying as you would he said he held no hate towards the murderer and he said he's forgiven him already and when we talk about evil evil to me is the thing that possessed that 18 year old to carry out these murders. Evil to me is whatever it was in the spirit of Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, the Moors murderers. That is evil. Megan is a foolish girl and I think she can be cruel because I think that what she and Harry, in particular Harry actually, because they're his family, I think what they did was cruel to the royal family, Charles and William, but also to the Queen because it damaged her 70 year reign, which is why I'm not frightened at all to speak out against that. But do I think she's evil? No. I would never accuse her or anyone on that scale of being evil, and I don't hate them. I've said since the dawn of this channel that I have love for Harry and Meghan, and that's not supposed to be some drippy cliche. All I mean by that is that aside from the rare exceptions of a few psychopaths, most of us exist somewhere on the spectrum between good and bad, and most of us are somewhere in between much of the time. I like to think that most of us inhabit that part of the scale which is towards goodness the vast majority of the time. But sometimes we can slip up. But I have no hate in my heart for Harry and Meghan. I hate certain things that they've done. And 
I find it quite sad that people seem so ready to carry such hatred in their hearts for jokers like Meghan and Harry. When I hear the interview from this victim's uncle, who carries no hatred, who says that he's inspired by the Christian values, he quoted something from the Bible, that he was following the tenets of the way that he was raised as a Christian, and you could see that he wasn't just repeating it as rote, he was genuinely telling us that he carried no hatred and that he forgave. This guy said, if he has it in his heart to already forgive the man who massacred his young niece or nephew, I, I can't remember what gender he, the child was in that circumstance, but if he has the capacity to do that, uh, I find it very difficult and, and I grapple with humans out there who despise Meghan and Harry and who claim that they're beyond redemption, beyond forgiveness. And if my taking this moderate approach, which I believe is a more royal approach and a more mature approach and just my general intuition, if that puts many of you off, if that means that you're going to unsubscribe and go find other channels that chime with your more voracious views, then so be it. As I've said, there are more important things in life to me. I have to be able to sleep at night. And you can tell me a million times that a Texas Ranger, you know, you told me this in the comments, a Texas Ranger told Megan to F off. So not everyone in Texas was happy that she was there. But when I asked you, who was this ranger? Can you name him? None of you could. It was just a rumor. When you told me that she had brought this massive crew that were all seen bundling off into Megan's van, this massive crew of cameras and photographers. Well, I watched the footage and all I could see was one assistant, one security guard, and then a mass of local random photographers who had nothing to do with her. And that was verified by actual named individuals at the community centre she helped out in, who were named, they exist, and they spoke of her being very sweet and humble. They didn't, some of them didn't know who she was, <laughs> which I thought was, which was great, because why would you? They said she was sweet, she was neighborly, and that she came with no entourage. So I will continue to make no apologies for following the truth and without fear or favor. And if that means sometimes sticking up for Meghan, then so be it. Much of the press in the kingdom has been on Meghan's back for not reaching out to Mr. Markle and make contact with him. Samantha and Thomas Jr. have made their displeasure very keenly felt online and in interviews, uh, berating Meghan. Uh, I don't care. Meghan's family are like any other family to me. It's none of my business. I don't care if she talks to her father or not. They're not the royal family, so people's family feuds are none of my business. Uh, I'm sure among you guys, some of you don't speak to your parents or they don't speak to you. It happens in life and it's nothing to do with me. If Meghan has her reasons for not speaking to her father, she might have some very valid ones. You know, I saw Tom Bower, or Boa, whatever it is, speaking as well saying that he had been talking to Mr. Markle on the phone last week. He's the chap that's writing an, another book about Meghan Markle. and He's another one that's been liaising with Mr. Markle behind the scenes and he can't understand how she could do this to her father. I was only speaking with him a few days ago. Well, isn't the, uh, isn't the clue in that, you know? It's difficult for me to feel too much sympathy when he does these kind of things, when he associates with the man who is writing a book to disparage his daughter. He's now friends with him amongst all the other detractors. And he was speaking to him a few days ago. And people wonder why Meghan can't trust him. And Samantha Markle, I believe, has a hell of a lot to do with this. As Thomas Jr. indicated in the interview I saw with him this morning, so much of this drama unfurled after Meghan made it clear to her father that Samantha and Thomas Jr. and the rest of the family were not going to be invited to the wedding and that it was only Thomas Sr. that was invited to walk her up the aisle, down the aisle, whatever it is. 
I believe that it was Samantha or Babe, as he calls her. I believe it was Babe's enragement at this that really complicated things between the two of them. Thomas Markle said in this interview today that Meghan insisted on the phone call to her father or the texts, whatever it was, she insisted that he disown Thomas and Samantha if he wanted to come to the wedding. Now, I believe my intuition is that he has reworded that. I do not imagine that she would say to Thomas Markle Sr., you must disown them if you are to come. I don't believe that, I believe that has been reimagined by either Samantha or Thomas Jr. They aren't words that Harry or Meghan would say to Thomas Markle. They wouldn't say, you have to disown your children, no. I believe that Samantha and possibly Thomas Jr. put their interests before their father's interests. I believe that they should have encouraged him to go to the wedding, whether or not they or anybody else was invited. Meghan comes from a family which has quite a lot of dysfunction, a lot of fallings out, and it seems she made the blanket decision to invite her parents and no other members of the family from either side. And I don't blame her for not inviting Samantha Markle. She's a piece of work, in my opinion, and they're hustlers. And Samantha's daughter agrees with me. She said in a televised interview, of course my mother Samantha doesn't like Meghan. This is in 2018, by the way, before the wedding. Of course Samantha doesn't like Meghan. This, as she's told me, started from a very early age. She hasn't liked Meghan since essentially she was born. She's told me stories about how she didn't want her around and how she never asked for Meghan and she's just been overall jealous of Meghan as soon as she got famous. And of course, when she started dating Prince Harry, she of course got an interest in Meghan, which she never had before. And suddenly she wants to be nice and be friends. And she's just saying how much she loves her sister after years and years of telling me and the rest of the family how much she hates Meghan and how much of a narcissist Meghan apparently is and how much of a horrible woman is, which isn't true at all. The book she wrote about Meghan won't be a tell-all, it will be a book of lies. Her rambling and her versions of what happened, none of it is going to be true. I honestly don't think Meghan has a reason to support her after all the vicious and just mean comments she's made about Meghan. She hasn't shown her any type of appreciation unless she wants money. And as I told you before, when I watched this interview, I believe every word that Samantha Markle's daughter said. I believed every word. I don't believe Samantha ever cared for Meghan and I think that she faked the times when she did before the wedding because she wanted an invite to this wedding. And I think it's disgusting. Samantha's daughter also says that she remembers Thomas Markle sending Samantha checks. She said Western Union checks of five or six hundred dollars twice a month, a couple of times a month, after she claimed financial troubles. She said she had troubles and she needed groceries. And then Samantha's daughter remembers that she would spend that money on bags and shoes. And many times bills would rack up ridiculous charges but she re refused to pay any of the bills. But she still kept taking uh, these uh, handouts from her father. Nothing she says is true. All she is doing is spreading lies. I think Samantha Markle should keep her nose out of Meghan's relationship with her father. I think it's Meghan's business if she wants to speak to her father or not. And I think Samantha should focus on her own relationships because her own daughter and her own mother don't speak to her. Are estranged. Why don't you sort those out first and get you all talking and jiving with each other before you stick your oar into their business? Sort your own family affairs out and focus on them. If anyone has made it difficult for her to communicate with her father, if anyone has put her off trusting him with any information, it's you. You were the one, Samantha Markle or Babe, you were the one that gave him the advice, however well-intentioned, to uh, have that paparazzi shot, that stream of paparazzi shots set up. It was your advice he took, rather than uh, Prince Harry and Meghan, who said, just don't speak to the press, whatever it is, however it goes. You are the one 
that convinced him to go against that advice and have these uh, paparazzi shots set up, which he's now trying to sue over for, I think. It always seems to be you behind it. It always seems to be you behind the hustling. It always seems to be you behind the people that then associate with Mr. Markle and don't do his reputation any favours because they're already Meghan detractors. So why would she trust him? Why would she reach out to him when he has formed this sort of club around him, not of impartial, neutral advisors or trustees or friends, but Meghan detractors? And you expect her to reach out to him and trust him? Yeah. So Meghan is in a sticky, sticky predicament because... From a PR perspective, this has got to be addressed in some kind of way. I know she wants to keep a regal silence over the machinations of her family dramas, but the silence in this case is not doing her many favours because it's leaving people able to run with whatever gossip they want. And the trouble with that is, even if she doesn't care if the world are talking about her and making wrong or right assumptions, I'm afraid it will damage her brand and it will damage her ability to merchandise. I don't see how she's going to be able to go forward continuously without addressing it. And I've thought maybe they're going to address it in Harry's memoir because he might speak at that time. Maybe she will address it in her own memoir in the coming months and years. Maybe that will happen. But because of her need and her craving to control the narrative at all costs, I can't imagine that she will let it go forever, no matter how private she wants to be about the issue. I can't imagine that she will let it go forever without putting her spin or her commentary or her truth onto whatever happened with her and her father. The Unseen Queen was broadcast on the BBC this week. Did you see it? I was confused a few days ago because there's another documentary from a few years ago called, it's the other way around, The Queen Unseen, The Unseen Queen. And this was the Queen Unseen, or the other way around. So there were a couple of them uh, revolting. But this was a new one with lots of unseen footage. Wasn't it wonderful to see Her Majesty with her father, who could look quite solemn and nervous in so many of his public pictures, but they were so affectionate and so loving and so sweet as a family, weren't they? It was wonderful to see that footage. And I think a lot, a lot of Her Majesty's you know, she can be accused of coldness at certain times as part of her reserve, you know, a hint of coolness. And I think a lot of it comes from the death of her father because she was so in love with him as a father and she managed to cope with his death at such a young age with such a plum and with so little apparent damage, you know, but she must have been very damaged. But she channeled it so well and with such maturity that it only behooved her in the end. It behooved her spirit. And I think that the way she dealt with that deep psychological trauma and the scars it must have left her with the help of her love, Prince Philip, undoubtedly. I think the way she managed to deal with that with such grace informed everything about the way she responds to the pressures and the anxieties of the world with such stillness. I think it's why she's able to look at such dramas that we see with the Harkles or whoever it is and not become invested in these things. She spoke in this documentary about with the passage of time one gets to look back and see how these events are just ephemeral little things which is perhaps why I don't get quite so traumatised by Megan showing up and paying her respects with a bunch of flowers, even if it is misguided, even if it did come across as ingratiating and vulgar in some ways, which I might agree with. It's an ephemeral moment and it's not something that I need to get my knickers in a twist about. She hasn't caused harm to anyone by doing this, uh, uh, except perhaps to herself and her image. I choose to be inspired by someone with a more mature, helpful approach, which is to respond as the Queen does, with a sense of reasoned logic, a sense of compassion. As she stated many times, she constantly turns toward and references 
her faith and the Christian values that were instilled in her. And that is where she draws her inspiration from. She doesn't just pay some kind of lip service and talk the talk. She walks the walk. It did make me wonder if some of those accusations that the Queen sometimes gets of being a bit cold or not very demonstrative, withholding affection uh, with regards perhaps to Charles growing up uh, more than she perhaps could have done. It made me wonder if perhaps that could have been as the result of having her fingers burnt from the loss of her father because she showered him with so much affection, so, so much joy. Did you see the footage of her combing his hair out of his face and patting him on the back? So wonderful and lovely to see. And I would imagine that it was very hard for her to lose that. This might just be my imagination, the sort of cod psychoanalysis, I, I understand that. I'm just, this is just guesswork, but it must make it difficult for her to be quite as effusive with her affections because something in her soul must be petrified that that thing that she loves uh, will be taken from her in a cruel swift manner again you know these things must echo in her psyche which make it difficult for her to, de to demonstrate that kind of tender affection as she once did when, when she was very young. Of course, I could be very mistaken there. I don't know what goes on behind closed doors and I'm sure she manages to express her affection very diligently, but perhaps not quite in the same effusive manner that she was able to do with her father because it was plain to see there for all of us in that footage, which was very moving and lovely to see the Queen, the queen Mother camping it up. Can't, it, it's easy to see why she was so beloved and surrounded by the gays and why she loved them because camping it up, my dear, just there's something in the way she walked, isn't there? She's such a fondant fancy. It, it is just there. She's vamping it for the camera. She's throwing a look here and there. Uh, so this is another one you should have watched. The high streets of Britain and all the shops are turning red, white and blue before our very eyes. Bunting everywhere, flags, flags everywhere. You're going to see so much of the Union Jack. I'm sure most of you understand the history of the Union Jack and what it represents, but just for those of you who don't, because I know that I do just get some casual observers here, the Union Jack or Union Flag, some people will insist that you call it the Union Flag, and actually they're wrong. Jack and Flag are both acceptable, and I love Union Jack, so that's what I'm going to call it. And there's actually a page on the official Royal website where it's referred to as the Union Jack but it represents the four nations of the United Kingdom. It's made up of three heraldic crosses. Back in those days, in 1606 it was, the Principality of Wales was already united with England, so that was all sort of mixed in together. So it, uh, unfortunately it doesn't get to have its dragon on there or one of their own sort of national colours. It is with us, uh, represented by the Red Cross of St George, our patron saint. The white saltire of Scotland is taken from their blue and white flag, and the red saltire of St Patrick is taken from Ireland, or Northern Ireland, since 1926. On its first introduction in 1606, it was just known as the British flag, or the flag of Britain, but later in 1625, it began appearing as the Union flag. No one's quite sure why they started referring to it as the Jack, but back in those days, Jack meant something small. And it was rather a small little flag that was flown from the mast on the bowsprit of a vessel, extending forward from the vessel's prow. And by 1674, it was described formally as His Majesty's Jack and officially acknowledged as the Union Jack. And because it was King James I that originally ordered the flag, people associate Jack with him because he used to sign off as Jacques in his signature. I've seen letters that he used to write his cousin abroad in French. He used a lot of French and would refer to himself as Jacques. So there was that association and because it was His Majesty's Jack, people were rumoured to have started using it because of King James. But by the 18th century, the short mast on the bow spirit was replaced by stay sails, and the ensign took over as the principal distinguishing naval flag. So it grew customary to fly the Union Jack only when in harbour. In 1902, 
an Admiralty Circular announced that either name, Union Jack or Union Flag, could be used officially, and in 1908, UK Parliament approved this verdict, stating that the Union Jack should be regarded as the national flag. So I've had my knuckles wrapped in the past for calling it the Union Jack by people who say, oh, it's, it's the Union flag, not the Jack, unless you're at sea. Well, apparently not. Apparently you can take your pick and call it whatever you like, and it's just as official. Thanks for popping in my fruit crumbles, and I'll see you in the next broadcast. If you'd like to treat me to a little cup of coffee, my tip jar's in the description box below. Or a scrumptious slice of cake. I might have to treat myself to a lovely scrumptious slice of cake this week because it's platinum week so there's an excuse for delicious pastries see you soon my dears toodle pip <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>